So I'm delighted to join you for the session to talk about rapid prototyping in general and the connection to the pandemic in particular. I direct this program, the Center for Bits and Atoms. And let me also note as I speak, this is interactive. So post uh, questions, burning ones will be fed to me to reply as I'm talking. And then at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes for uh, Q&A uh, for this to be an interactive session. So. CBA was created to study and break down the boundary between digital and physical. And that included things like we were part of creating some of the first quantum computations, we're part of creating minimal synthetic life where you design life in a computer. And so literally turning bits into atoms. What's also interesting is the people who did the work. Uh, my student Jason built and now runs all the computers at Facebook. My student Rafi built and used to run all the computers uh, at Twitter. And that's because to do that, you can't believe in, in a sense, you can't believe in computer science. You can't believe in software separate from hardware. They have to take billions of dollars, megawatts of power, tons of mass, and turn it into information. And so you need to uh, deeply integrate them. So against that background, um, uh, we've been, let's see, sorry, the, okay, it's just a little lag to update. Uh, against that background, we've been very busy with the immediate COVID response. And so I wanna talk a bit about that, then about the research roadmap beyond it, and come back to how rapid prototyping has a potentially really profound role to play in not just the immediate response, but the recovery from the pandemic. So using CBA's facilities, early on we were approached about ways we could help with it. And that's led to a really interesting working group of about 150 people, uh, all working on rapid prototyping for the COVID response. And the work we've been doing progresses immediately from personal protective equipment urgently needed uh, to instrumentation to help with testing, to technology for respiratory assistance, and increasingly is pivoted to technology to help with the recovery, monitoring and steps beyond it. Uh, in this, we found there's a lot of issues in the do-it-yourself responses that really need uh, research guidance. Things like 3D printers alone can't do much to help with the pandemic, but rapid prototyping can. A good example is right away there was an urgent need for shields uh, to protect healthcare workers. There are lots of versions of 3D printing them. In a collaboration with a number of colleagues at MIT, we found first from particle modeling, from uh, computational fluid dynamics, you really needed to fold the shield around the face to protect all the ways the particles can come in. And then the 3D printed shields were themselves a point for um, a vector for the uh, virus to get in. That really interesting collaboration to make a Kirigami folded shield. So just cutting and folding, eliminating the printing. Uh, on the top, I'm showing rapid prototyping of that. Then in the medical testing, among the things that came up was the need to flip it up, ways to make it more comfortable for the healthcare workers, a lot of iteration on that. And then from there, it went into designs that can be made by rapid prototyping, but then could quickly go into die cut for volume manufacturing to make uh, millions of these. And so a lot of research went into simplifying and improving the design, and now uh, that's propagating and scaling. And so there's this connection between running the research on campus and then connecting it uh, for the global impact. And the working group I described has really interesting weekly sessions. It's driven collaborations unlike anything I've seen uh, on campus and around the world uh, to meet the needs of the pandemic. All the work there is posted publicly. And if you're particularly interested in actively participating, contact me and I can connect you more deeply into the program. So to do that work, the most profound implication I'm going to end with today is how rapid prototyping cannot just meet the immediate pandemic needs, um, but how it can help us recover along a different pathway. And so to tell that story, I wanted to take you through the research roadmap in CBA's work from now into the future and then come back to the present. So CBA started with an unusual NSF proposal roughly to assemble one of every tool to make anything of any size. And so we put together from molecular to macro scale tools to make and measure almost anything, an unusual facility. 
you can view that as a descendant. MIT invented computerized manufacturing um, uh, in 1952. Uh, so this was at the birth of real-time computing. Jet aircraft were just emerging and there are parts hard to make by hand. And so there's this idea to connect uh, the real-time computer to the machine to make parts. And so that was the birth of computers controlling machines. And really the state of the art today isn't much different than that. The computer controls the machine with a head that does something. You can view the lab I run at MIT as the successors of those tools. So I had a problem. It would take a lifetime of MIT classes to learn to use those machines. So with colleagues, I started a class modestly called How to Make Almost Anything, just to teach rapid prototyping, and was completely unprepared for the response. Hundreds of students try to get in every year to the class, and they're there not to do a thesis or a startup, really, they're there to make things. And they did the most amazing projects. Kelly made a device that saves up screens when you're mad and plays them back later. And this is a web browser for parrots. And this is an alarm clock you wrestle with to prove you're awake. And this is a dress that defends your personal space. And every year there was just these fun, neat projects done. And I began to realize the students were answering a question I didn't ask. I was asking how to go from digital to physical. They were really answering why. And to understand why that's so interesting, the real-time computer was a result of the whirlwind. MIT made the first significant real-time computer that was transistorized at Lincoln Labs as the T, that was commercialized as the PDP. The PDP was used to create the internet. Most everything you do on a computer today was first done with that. Uh, this is Ken Olson, the founder of Digital, famously saying, nobody needs a computer at home. There's a little context to that, but, but he did say that. What happened was when computers became personal, the whole mini computer industry surrounding Boston couldn't make that transition. It wasn't for Victorian payroll, it was personalizing computing. In the same way the students were showing, the killer app of digital fabrication is personal fabrication, not mass production, but production for a market all the way down to one person, very similar to the personalization of computing with the same disruptive impact. So inspired by that, we were then uh, started a project called Fab Labs. A PDP cost initially maybe $100,000, weighed a few tons, filled a room. There were thousands of them. And thousands happens to be the number of cities on Earth. And so for National Science Foundation outreach initially, we set up a mini version of my lab at MIT that's roughly the cost and complexity of a PDP called a Fab Lab. It includes a 3D printer but it also includes 10 other tools to go from digital to physical. And with that, you can make everything on the right, boats, bicycles, furniture, consumer electronics, production tooling. That's not a startup, it's not research, it's community labs producing them. And then they accidentally went viral. Lower left, I'm showing the world map of Fab Labs. And there is just about as far north and south as you can go on earth, rural, urban. Uh, they spread over the planet. We didn't plan that, but there's been this viral spread of these labs. Uh, these are some of the sites working with at-risk youth in Detroit, with gross national happiness in Bhutan, mixed communities in Israel, Protestant Catholic boundary in Northern Ireland, Alaska natives. All of these sites are integrating digital fabrication into their communities for a range of transformative impacts. Uh, to keep up with that, we started a program called the Fab Academy to do the same sort of education I'm doing at MIT on this hands-on making, but done in a global way. So students have peers in work groups with mentors in local labs, and then we connect them globally. Uh, and that's led to a Fab Academy for textile technology, a bio academy with uh, a range of colleagues to teach uh, biotechnology. And that in turn has led to some really surprising impacts that I would have never expected from what just started as a rapid prototyping project. Uh, this is Barcelona's mayor. Barcelona has a fabulous design sense and over 50% youth unemployment. A whole generation can't work. What's happening in that picture is he's starting a 40 year countdown to urban self-sufficiency. You expect the city to provide electricity and clean water. What they're now doing is they're setting up these rapid prototyping labs as part of the urban infrastructure. They describe it as the city today is a product to trash conversion device. Products go in one side, trash goes out the other. They want 
the atoms to stay and the bits to travel. So data comes and goes, but the city produces and consumes locally. Uh, and if you live in the city, instead of jobs to work, to money, to employment, you have the means to produce what you consume. A, a very different relationship between production and consumption. And that profound change, not just a smart city, but a fab city, has led to a number of leading, leading cities around the world joining Barcelona in this initiative to empower cities to produce what they consume. On the left, I'm showing a lab we ran at the Obama White House. That collaboration led to legislation right now in the House and Senate that, uh, so uh, today there's a notion of universal access to computing and communication as a kind of a right. This bill says access to the means to do digital fabrication is a new kind of right for which we should aim for universal access, initially at the granularity of congressional districts, to empower not a national lab as a billion dollar facility with guards at the gate, but a new kind of national lab made out of connected local labs. The national labs can struggle to have community impacts, startup impact. This sort of brings the lab to the people. So very interesting legislation. If you're interested, you can just reach out to your local representatives or se uh, senators uh, to help support it. It's an unusually bipartisan bill. So not just uh, different parties, but also rural, urban, north, south, all the axes you can think of this spans and can, everybody agrees on the value and the impact of it. Uh, um, one of the interesting offshoots of that is there's a number of companies we're working with like Airbus, Dassault Systems, uh, uh, GE, Chevron, to help them set up these fab labs nominally as community outreach investment in the communities they work, but with the profound back action over and over we see the idea is they think this is for their engineers to help the community, but as much knowledge goes from the community back to the engineers. And um, many of the companies found kids in fab labs have better access to rapid prototyping than their own employees. So there's a really interesting synergy with large companies collaborating with these in ways that help others, but also help benefit them. To keep all of that growing, we've had to spin off a nonprofit fab foundation, a community portal, Fab Labs IO. It's way beyond what I can run from my office at MIT. And my colleague, Sherry Lassiter, who manages this program, uh, noticed something interesting. At the top, I'm showing the five points Gordon Moore plotted for what became Moore's Law. And he projected that transistors would keep doubling on integrated circuits. He projected 10 years. In the middle, I'm showing the 50 years of Moore's Law digital scaling. And at the bottom, I'm showing 10 years of these fab labs spreading. They've been doubling for more than a decade, growing exponentially. Uh, this has come to be called Lass's Law for Sherry Lassiter instead of Moore's Law. And what it suggests is there's more data than Gordon Moore had. And so you should really take seriously the notion that this is going to scale for 50 years. Um, 